coming to you from the Deep South. This is the Blue Collar Leadership Podcast. High impact leadership is not reserved for leaders, and it has nothing to do with your position, title, or rank. However, it does have everything to do with your character. It's time to climb to the next level and beyond, personally and professionally. Now, let's start making it happen with your host, Max Story. Hello, and thanks for listening to the Blue Collar Leadership Podcast today. So today we're halfway into my Blue Collar Leadership and Teamwork series, and I, I've interrupted it a few times with some special guests, and t- today I'm going to interrupt it here half, halfway through the series with a, a very special guest, my wife, Rhea, and uh, she's, she's just written a, a great new book this year. I'm really excited about it, and she is too, so I'm happy to have her on to talk about it. The title of this book is her new book is The Ladder of Influence, and the subtitle is Five Steps for Climbing to the Next Level and Beyond. So welcome to the Blue Collar Leadership, Rhea. Thanks. I'm so glad to be here. You excited about this book or what? I am. I am. This is the one of the things I'm just really excited about because it kind of gives us a structure on how to how do we get more influence. So excited to talk about that. Well, Ted, just give me an over, overview of whatever you want to share at the moment as we get going before I start diving in and asking you some questions about it. Well, you know, to me, influence is one of those things that we all want influence. We all at some level need influence. We want to influence people at work. We want to influence the people around us. We want to influence the people at home and our personal lives and personal relationships. And, and it's critical, right? Influence and the ability to influence people is critical skill in life, but no one really talks about, or at least no one in my career or none of my college courses or anything like that, no one ever talked about how to influence people. And, you know, I at some point didn't think I was any good at leadership or influence um, in terms of, you know, just natural ability. But when I realized that influence is a skill that we can develop all of us can improve. And when we improve on our influence, we get more influence, we get more options, we get more opportunities, we get more choices, and life gets better when we have more options, more opportunities, and more choices. So who'd you write this book for specifically? Um, You know, I really wrote this book for someone, that person who's never necessarily studied leadership at a deep level, or that person who has read some leadership, but doesn't necessarily know how in a practical way to apply the principles of leadership and influence to their life. So in this book, you know, I start with just the the very foundational concept of what influence is and, and why we want it. But then I also go into the what I call the ladder of influence and how to climb the steps on the ladder of influence so you increase your influence as you go. And then in, in several of the chapters um, for each step of the ladder, I include both a personal and a prof- professional application. So kind of a checklist of here's how you apply this principle at work. Here's what it would look like to apply that at home. So really both the the principles that someone can learn from, but also some some tips and some practices and some application um, at both at work and at home, because I think that helps us when we know what it looks like to apply it. It's easier for us to do and apply the principle. Okay. So I know when I read it, helping you proof it and, and, edit it. I was really, really liking this book. So first, the first thing I'd like for you to do, and also just share with my audience, my regular listeners that I I, I highly encourage you to get you a copy of this book. It's going to, it's going to help you paint, uh, give you a mental picture of the, of the big picture of why you need to read all these other books that I'm always talking about my books and Ria's other books. This, this book is really that provides that big picture concept to you so to help you learn how to grow and how to use other books and, and why you need to use other books and and then also it's got the, the competency component but before we kind of talk more about any of the steps in depth real just 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 walk the people up the ladder real quick walk the listeners up just tell them what the five steps are sure so i use the framework as a ladder because it's clear there are different degrees of influence and different ways that we can influence different people. And I use the framework of a ladder because the degrees of influence stack on top of one another. So starting at the very bottom, the first step really on the ladder of influence is control of self. 
Because if you don't have control of self, if you're not able to be proactive, you lose influence with other people. So the way I describe this is if if you've ever lost your temper and yelled at someone and expect them to like and trust you more, or maybe you've been on the receiving end, someone gets mad and, and blames you for something and you thought, man, I like you a little bit more now that you yelled at me, right? That never happens. So a lot of times we don't realize that when we're not able to be proactive in the moment and have control over, over ourselves, over our emotions, over our choices, over our habits, then that can cause us to lose influence with some people. So that's the, the bottom level. And the second step is what I call the character development, because as time passes, your character is either going to strengthen or weaken relationships because who you are inside as a person your character is going to influence other people either positively or negatively and every interaction you have based on your character you're either building influence and trust in the relationship or you're decreasing trust in the relationship so for example you generally would have more influence with your spouse than you ever would with someone you've just met, unless you have a bad relationship with your spouse, and then you may not have a lot of influence with them either. So the third step is competency. So for example, if you're really great at your job and you have a, a reputation of being skilled or being an expert, maybe you've been there for many years and you, you know how to do the job really well, you have a degree of influence with someone who comes to you for help at work. Or maybe you are you know, self-employed, but you are an expert in your field and your niche, that's going to come with some influence based on your competency, your skills. The fourth level on the ladder of influence is commitment to developing others. And this is someone who is a trusted mentor, who's poured into someone else, because that requires some sacrifice, but it brings with it influence. And then the fifth level is the contribution of service over time. And at this level, uh, this step uh, on the ladder of influence, we have poured into people and developed them for so many people for so long that we, we reach at the highest level um, on the step of the ladder of the influence. So you move to a higher degree of influence as you climb higher. And you can't just jump to the top step, right? No one can just decide to wake up tomorrow and say, oh, I want to be known as a as a with a legacy of contributing to other people. You have to start climbing from the bottom. All right. That's, so that's that's some good stuff. And 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 for the listeners also, you, you formatted this book the way we format most of our books today with 30 chapters, three page format. So there it's easy reads, it's full of gold. I'm telling my listeners right now it's full of gold because when I read it, it was it was hard for me to edit it because it was so good. It made me <laughs> think think so much i kept having to pause and think and i'm trying to just read the book and edit and look for typos or missing letters you know that sort of stuff or extra words and i mean it was it was uh it, it was fun to read it but it was hard to edit it because i was <laughs> more reading it than editing it so uh, I'm, I'm excited to see you share this book you know all all around the country and, and beyond so i want to ask you just reference you to page page two in the book. I, I'm going to just read a quote there and a little bit of it from uh, a quote from Dale Carnegie. It says that you have in the book, it says influence is ultimately and ultimately an outcropping of trust. The higher the trust, the greater the influence. And that's from Dale Carnegie. And on that page, page two, you say the ladder of influence provides a powerful yet simple framework to help you realize the practical steps you can take to increase your influence with people around you, friends, family, followers, coworkers, your boss, team members, community members, children, spouses, and you say maybe even ex-spouses too. And, and then you say there are three truths you must know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can, can, can you share about those three truths? Sure. Uh, I think it's critical to understand uh, these three truths as we go into a conversation about increasing influence. The first thing, number one, you cannot change anyone but yourself. And so, so much of the time I meet people who want to improve a relationship at home or at work. Maybe it's a, improving a relationship with their teenager, or maybe it's improving the relationship with their boss. They want more influence with the person who's, you know, determining their pay increases, right? That's normal. But so many of the time, I, 
I meet these people and they want to spend all their time blaming a lack of influence in the situation on someone else. And that, number one, it just breaks my heart because as long as we're blaming someone or something else for our circumstances and situation, we're never going to do anything to fix it because we're blaming the other person. And we're also giving away our freedom to try and improve it. So if I'm always blaming someone for the situation, I'm not going to change anything because I believe it's their fault. And at the end of the day, you can't change other people. You can't make other people do anything. You can't control other people. All you can do is change yourself. And hopefully the changes that you make will help you increase your influence in this situation. But you've got to stop blaming other people and start working on what you can change yourself. And that's not easy, right? It says easy and it does hard because we naturally just want to externalize blame, but that does not help us move forward in life. The second thing that I, I want people to know is there are going to be people that you cannot influence because they don't share your values. So maybe this is someone in at your work who they've been there for 30 something years and they're really just coasting on the way out. They're not interested in change. They're not interested in new ideas or new technology. They don't value growth. They're kind of just really coasting on the way out and they don't they don't value change. So if you value change, you're going to have a tough time increasing your influence with them at any at any level. So there are going to be a few people that you just simply cannot influence. And, you know, at the end of the day, don't blame them and, and don't hate them. Don't fight them. They're just going in a different direction in life. And at the end of the day, they get to choose the path they travel. So it's important for us to realize, yes, there are a few people we cannot influence. But if we stay true to our course and keep climbing the ladder of influence, sometimes we might gain influence with that person just because we refused to give up, right? Staying positive and staying on track. And then number three, you actually never get to stop climbing because you're always going to be at different places at different times in different relationships on the ladder of influence. So you might be at the fourth step in one relationship and you're mentoring somebody that you know in an effort to give back. And then you meet someone new tomorrow and you're starting at the bottom of the ladder of influence with that new relationship because you're just developing trust and influence in that relationship so all five steps you're you're going to be striving to climb at different levels at different times with different people and just like a real letter ladder you you can't skip steps right you have to start at the bottom and climb diligently that's good stuff for you so those three truths in, in a recap, you, you can't change anyone except yourself. Mm -hmm. There will be people you simply cannot influence and you never stop climbing. Mm -hmm. So that's true. Some good, that's some good stuff for you. <laughs> so, so I want well, you to you, talk about, go ahead. I was just going to say, you're biased. You're married to me. Absolutely. I know how good you are. These other people don't really know, <laughs> but I'm trying to help them understand. <laughs> I've been with you 23 years. I know you're a rock star. I also oh, okay. know I'm the backup singer, right? Okay. <laughs> you're the main attraction. I'm the side mm, show. Sure. A lot of people, a lot of people already know that. They just didn't know that I knew that. But see, now my audience <laughs> knows I know what they know also if they know you. So I'm gonna jump over to page 10. I'm just let picking out certain things for you to talk about and uh expand on. I obviously can't talk about the whole book probably could take 10 or 12 hours to talk about the whole book but i want to talk about you got these first three chapters in the book uh for, for those listening who maybe haven't read the book actually is there a place they can download an excerpt of this or or some chapters or what do you have out there you got something like that already don't you yep i do um there are two places that they can download uh, an excerpt they can go to riastory.com forward slash download or they can go to bluecollarleadership.com forward slash download yeah, on my page, the, the Blue Collar Leadership page, they see my stuff, but there's a link to your stuff. Yep, yep. And I'll and just see a picture with the title, The Ladder of Influence, on, mm -hmm. on your page. Yep. And what will they get there? Uh, they'll they'll get a, an excerpt of the, the first couple of chapters. Okay, so these the first three chapters in, in The Ladder of Influence is kind of like, just warm, just kind of like an intro. It's warming you up. The first chapter is The Ladder of Influence. Second chapter is Why Ladder. And... 
uh, chapter three is climbing the steps. And that's what I want to talk on here for a minute before we kind of dive a little deeper into some of the steps. But uh, on page 10, Rhea talks about, uh, you know, she says, for example, if you tell, or for, first she says, when it comes to influence, who you are matters. What you say matters. But what you do matters most because who you are on the inside determines how you do what you do. And she says, for example, if you tell someone you'll meet them at 10 a.m., but you don't show up until 1030 a.m., they may forgive you, but they won't trust you as much as they did before. They, they now know you can't be counted on to keep small commitments and you don't value their time. So, so Rhea, you and I, me, me and you, we both get stood up a lot, don't we? Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things that, you know, when someone makes a commitment to you, maybe it's a, maybe it's just, hey, I'll call you at a certain time. You know, a lot of people on LinkedIn are, you know, calling, reaching out and saying, hey, could we, could we set up a call? I want to ask you for some advice or something like that. And you can set a time with that person and then they, they don't call. And that is one of the things that causes them to lose influence with me, because as you and I both know, we're both busy and we both plan our day around, you know, appointments with other people, phone calls, coaching calls, engagements. And when someone doesn't value my time or their time at a high enough level to honor the commitment they make, that's going to cause them to lose influence with me pretty quickly. Um, It's very rare that I... Uh, offer a second opportunity to do that if particularly if there's no relationship there already um if it's someone i'm I'm just meeting yeah that's that's painful we both deal with that far too much it, it's it's pretty sad actually that that's the the integrity of the majority of people is that they don't keep commitments they, they don't mind making them but that they don't want to keep them so they do lose a lot of influence right if they're doing that with us they're doing that with a lot of other people too sure i'm sure so in the second second page of that chapter, you say uh, someone who's climbed higher on the ladder of influence will have higher standards relative to integrity, respect, and influence in relationships than someone who has not climbed as high. What what do you, what do you mean when you say that? Well, someone who's climbed higher or relative to the ladder of influence is going to have, you know, higher standards because they have developed their character to a greater degree. And so what I mean by that is, for example, if you're 15 years old and you tell your best buddy, hey, you know, I'll call you later, um, probably even if you forget, you, you probably are losing a little bit of trust and influence. But, you know, there's not a high expectation there at, at that age for that relationship, right? But someone who has grown and, you know, maybe they're in a professional environment and they have developed their character to a higher level, then there's going to be a higher expectation. So anytime we've climbed higher on the ladder than someone else, we're going to have higher standards relative to character and development and respect, particularly with um, relationships that we have a lot of time invested in. Um, and it's it's sort of like being tall enough to see over the fence. I like that analogy. And yeah. someone else is not able to see why it's as big a deal. But for someone like you or or me, then it is a big deal when someone makes a commitment to have a phone call and doesn't keep it. It doesn't mean they're bad people. It's just that they don't know what they don't know about how much influence it's causing them to lose. Or they don't have the character to care, which in, in either case means they haven't climbed as high on the ladder of influence. And there again, it doesn't mean they're bad people. It just means a lot of times we haven't grown to a level that we see that the little things are the big things with people. And when it comes to influence, everything matters. That's absolutely true. So, so that's some great points you're making there. So at the end of that chapter, on page 12, the last paragraph in there, you say, there are no shortcuts when it comes to influence. If you haven't truly started at the bottom of the ladder of influence and climbed the steps, based on your control of self, character, and competency, which are the first three steps, character development, competency development, it will quickly become evident to those who have. You won't be able to truly influence others who have a high degree of of character. So Mm -hmm. why, why why can't we influence people with higher character than ours? And, and sometimes we can. So how, 
why can't we sometimes? And then other times, why can we? How are we able to? Well, it's it's just like if someone, let's say someone is not able to control themselves, for example. Let's say someone, someone you work with always has a bad temper and they're always blowing up when something goes wrong at work every single time. And it's known, right? Everyone in, in the workplace knows that when this person has something that goes wrong, they're going to lose their temper. They're going to get mad. They're going to yell. Maybe they throw things. I don't know. But you're the type of person that even when things go wrong, you've learned to be proactive and say, you know what? I might feel like throwing a temper tantrum, but that's not going to help me find a solution. So let me, you know, be proactive, put those emotions to the side. And instead of responding based on how I feel, the anger of the moment or the frustration, let me be proactive and find a solution. So if you're the type of person who can be proactive, you're that person who is not able to be proactive is not going to be able to influence you very much in that situation because you're just higher on the ladder of influence relative to control of self. And so it's kind of like once you understand a principle and, and how to apply it, it's much simpler to do. It may not be easy, but if someone isn't there yet in terms of understanding or development, then you're just higher you're at a higher level of, of awareness of self-awareness of awareness of how these principles work and so someone who can't be proactive in that situation is not going to be able to influence you as much because they're busy throwing a temper tantrum and you're busy looking for a solution so when we apply that to some of the other levels for example if someone let's say you're very skilled like you, Mac, you're, you know, a, an expert when it comes to blue collar leadership and, and developing uh, leaders in the frontline workspace and those who lead them. And someone who is not as competent in that field is not going to be able to influence you very much relative to that field or that topic at a high level, because you're just at a higher level in terms of competency. So, for example, I mean, we know you're gifted at connecting with blue collar workforce and, you know, helping share the principles with them. So if someone were to come up and tell you you're doing it wrong, they wouldn't be able to influence you very much with respect to that because you already know you're at a higher level of competency relative to that. It's also I mean, this applies in so many different ways. It's the gym instructor who's overweight and or, you know, is is really struggling to increase influence or inspire people to be physically fit if they are struggling to make good health choices themselves. So that's a good, that's a good lead in to uh, a couple of things when you talk about uh, control of self in, mm -hmm. in the beginning of, of that chapter on control of self on pages 14 and 15. A couple of things I want I want you to talk about. The first thing is you you often talk about your inner two year old living mm -hmm. inside of us, and and then also uh, if you if you say something about that, and then kind of blend in with the 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 four dimensions of life that you talk about on page fifteen, just to help people, just kind of see the big picture. Yeah, so I mean, humans have a natural tendency to respond to the world around them based on emotions of the moment. That's normal. That's human. And, you know, th there's a reason we call it the terrible twos, because when you're two years old, you literally do respond just based on the emotions of what you're feeling. If someone doesn't let you have a toy, you cry. If someone, you know, if you're hungry, you cry, you, you fuss. Um, you know, if the, that, that literal two-year-old is learning how to influence the world around them. And they get to be very good at it. You know, sometimes they figure out they can be very effective at influencing mom and dad to give them what they want if they are willing to throw the temper tantrum. So I did all that till I was like 40. <laughs> well, some of us do, <laughs> but you can get away slow with learner. <laughs> You can get away with it at two years old, right? But when you do the equivalent at 30 or 40, you're losing influence because at some level, people start to expect you to be able to control your emotions and say, yeah. yeah. I, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I went through the terrible twos for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so parents out there, <laughs> there's hope. There's beware. Hope. Well, there's hope. Yeah. Beware. 
Beware if you don't uh, parent the way you, maybe you should. This book will actually help you with parenting. But go ahead, Rhea. I got sidetracked thinking about <laughs> how long I lived in my terrible twos. Yeah, People who so, listen maybe don't know, but uh, maybe they don't. True. Maybe they don't. <laughs> so the key is realizing that we can control ourselves. And when we do, we climb higher on the ladder of influence. Now, none of us are going to be perfect, right? We all make mistakes. We all are going to get it wrong. There are going to be bad days. But the more often we get it right, the more we can increase our influence. And this concept applies in all four dimensions of life. So the, the four dimensions of life, number one, the heart dimension, right? This is our, our spiritual or faith-based dimension where we choose our values. And then number two, the head dimension. This is our emotional intelligence, our, our personal growth, our thoughts, the health dimension, which is our physical body, our environment around us. And then number four is the social hierarchy dimension or the relationship area where we see the impact of our influence with others. So control of self is related to all of them. Um, the health dimension, for example, again, that uh, you know, personal trainer who's not in shape is going to struggle to inspire his or her clients to really work hard because obviously they haven't developed enough control of themselves in that in that health dimension. Um, the head dimension, emotional intelligence, personal growth, you know, if you have not grown and developed yourself and your ability to develop your emotional intelligence, you're not going to have as much influence with someone who has. Um, spiritual or faith-based there again if you have a very deep spiritual journey and you've really been intentional about your faith and your values you're not going to be able to and you're you're someone who does not have that is not going to be able to influence you at a high level and there again it doesn't mean someone's bad it just means either they don't value it or they haven't developed enough awareness to realize it matters so the interesting thing is that the choices we make in those first three dimensions head, heart, and our health dimension, those are impacting the influence that we have in our social hierarchy dimension, the relationship area, right? The choices that I make physically can impact my influence. I mean, if someone stops by at your house and your house is a mess, they might be thinking, well, gosh, is it always a mess, right? And so that's one reason we scramble around and clean up when company's coming. Mm. But it's it's interesting because we we realize at some level that a cleaner house and nicer picked up house makes us look better. So we might run around and, and try to pick up the house. Um, we might not care. And, you know, or maybe we just are saying authentically, hey, this is how I live and that's OK. But just realizing sometimes these choices are impacting us. Um, sometimes we don't realize it. That's just a good example of most people can relate to to cleaning the house when they know company's coming right go, um oh, go ahead well i was just gonna say i i had mentioned what the first three chapters were and you talked earlier about the the five steps mm -hmm. and i just want to let the listeners know right now what i'm doing is is each, each one of the steps you've got you've got five steps and you've also got uh five chapters for each step and so what we're doing, what I'm leading you through is just to kind of give the audience, the listeners, a kind of a preview of, of, of the five chapters related to control of self. So what, what Rhea has just been talking about and expanding upon is the, the first step influence based on self-control. That's the first chapter related to that step. So I want to talk about a little, get Rhea to talk a little bit about this, the second chapter related to uh, control of self and that chapter is actually chapter five but it's the second chapter related to that step and it's titled climbing to the first step and mm -hmm. so we'll kind of going to give you give you the audience uh, a, a kind of preview of these five chapters related to the the first step but then what you'll know if you read the book there's five chapters kind of with the same title but related to the different step for each step as you go so like this one where we just got done doing the first step influence based on control of self. The next one is climbing to the first step, then the first step at home. Then the next chapter is the first step at work. And then it's mastering the first step. And then we move into the second step and we ain't going to get too deep into the second, third, fourth, and fifth step, but I just kind of want to give you an outline, give you a feel of how this book kind of flows. So it's, 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 it's really good. I think Rhea did a phenomenal job on the way she outlined this book and created the format and everything. So 
climbing to the first step, really. And uh, again, we're still talking about control of self at this moment. And on page 19, you, you introduce the reader through an illustration you have there on the page called the, the choice cycle. Mm -hmm. So talk about that, kind of try to paint a mental picture for those who can't see it, who don't have the book at the moment. But what, what is that choice cycle? What's the purpose of that? Well, Stephen Covey uh, and the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People talked about, you know, when something happens, human beings have the freedom to pause and choose their response. So when something happens, there's a stimulus, we have the ability to pause and be intentional with how we respond. So I really wanted to drill down that concept a little deeper. And so I've kind of got a five section uh, wheel, if you want, you know, just a big circle that's divided in five equal parts. And the first part is stimulus, something happens. So let's say, um, let's say I burn myself cooking. And so that's a stimulus, right? I've burned myself cooking, burned on the, on the oven. And so the second um, part of that cycle is the beliefs, the thoughts or the stories. Um, so I could say, you know, the, the thoughts or the story I tell myself was, man, it's the stove's fault for being too hot, right? And that's going to cause me to move to this third step in the cycle, the feelings, instinctive emotions. So if I'm telling myself, man, it's the stove's fault, I'm blaming the stove for being too hot, it's the stove's fault, then I'm going to be mad at the stove. And then I might, that might cause me to make a choice, an action or behavior to, you know, kick the stove, like bad stove, bad mm -hmm. stove, right? And then the next um, or the last step in that cycle would be the impact on circumstances. I now have a broken toe from kicking the stove, right? So that's an example. I'm of sure an... someone's done that. before. <laughs> I'm sure someone has. You, you know, until you got to that, the listener might have be, <laughs> might have been thinking, "What in the world is Rhea talking about? <laughs> a, burning a stove and, and blaming a stove?" But I guarantee you, people have been have hurt themselves on some kind of object that's yep. not another human being or an animal, <laughs> just a just an object, and then then they get mad and hit the thing or kick the thing, and it. Go ahead. Yep. I'm just I'm just helping the listeners understand. <laughs> we, y'all, us, human beings, we we do this. It sounds crazy right now, just listening to it calmly. But uh we've all done something like that. Go ahead, mm -hmm. Real. So that's an example of a choice that was negative, right? A choice that was reactive, it didn't serve us. So let's use that same scenario, a stimulus, same stimulus. I burned my hand on the stove. The beliefs that I have, the thoughts and the, the story I tell myself is, wow, I should have been more careful. I should have had a bigger oven mitt. I should have been using the oven mitt. Uh, maybe it's time for to replace these oven mitts. But I make a, a positive, proactive choice in the thoughts and the story that I tell myself. I'm taking responsibility for I burned myself on the stove but here are some things that I could have done to prevent that. And that's going to cause me to feel better, right? I'm still going to have a, a burned sore hand, but rather than feeling frustrated or angry at the stove, I'm going to feel better and more control of the situation. I'm going to say, hey, I don't have to burn my hand on the stove tomorrow and the next day because I'm going to get better oven mitts. And so the next choice in response to that would be, well, pick up some oven mitts or use the oven mitts next time you're working with the stove and the impact on my circumstances. Well, I don't have a broken toe from kicking the stove, right? So same scenario or same stimulus, but two different pa possible paths, starting with the choice, emotional choice that we make. Now, I mean, certainly we get to the point of physical choices too, but I think the most powerful thing is realizing that the moment of choice that Covey's talking about, pause and choose your response, isn't the physical choice. It's great if you can get the physical choice right in how you respond, but if you can get the emotional choice right first, you're going to have a much better day, much better career, much better life, because you're going to realize that regardless of what happens, no one else can make you have a bad day or a bad week or a bad life. That hey, power of emotional choice. Yes. That's, that's good stuff. So to recap this choice cycle, if you could see it, it looks like a big pie chart. It's got five, you know, five pieces of the pie, like a pizza. And, uh, it starts out with stimulus. Something happens. 
then that that leads you know to your beliefs your you, your beliefs provide you with thoughts and and you tell yourself a story and those beliefs lead to the next piece so so you're on the third piece of the pie so to speak which are your feelings which come from your beliefs and your thoughts and your stories and and that uh that provides your instinctive emotions as you list in the book and those feelings lead you to your choices which are your actions and behaviors the the fourth piece of the pie and then that determines the impact on your circumstances do your circumstances get better or worse or remain the same and whatever that is that creates a new stimulus yep something, something else happens and because of that and you just you yep. go around and around so you just touched on something though you was talking about the stove and yes yeah, stoves cause us problems every now and then and other other objects but what causes us the most problem are people yes <laughs> so you t you talked about somebody making you so mad or whatever go through that same little scenario and talk about the two different ways you could see when you know someone does something that irritates you or whatever that's the stimulus someone done yeah. something you didn't like or you know use use a person instead of, instead of a stove um well the person i spend the most time with is you so that's oh uh -oh, never mind let's move on to the next chapter <laughs> so let's, <laughs> let's say move, hypothetically let's move on to the next chapter <laughs> I, I asked bad questions. <laughs> let's say hypothetically. <laughs> um, no, let's talk the truth. Let's say hypothetically oh, stimulus. Something happens. Um, let's say someone hey, makes a what? Tell the story you tell from the stage sometime where you talk about. Uh, where you were blaming me for something about your planet. <laughs> it's much that? more fun to tell the story about you blaming me for something. <laughs> Well, I did okay. something though. I was provided the stimulus and then, you know, you had the beliefs and sure. you so, teach this exact thing from the stage, two different I, ways. So, I do. Yeah. So, um, this was several years ago because I was still teaching group fitness at the time. And because of our travel schedule, you know, I really had to be proactive and intentional about looking ahead at my schedule pretty far in advance to make sure there were no conflicts because if I wasn't going to be there to teach my class at the gym I had to get someone to agree to cover that so anytime I knew we were going to be traveling out of town I would look ahead and say oh I'm not going to be here Thursday I need to get somebody to cover that class well for you you know for you and me we kind of consider anything in this metro Atlanta within a two hour plus drive is local and so we had a local speaking opportunity coming up. And so because it was local, quote unquote, I didn't get someone to cover my class. And the night before I went out to the back porch and asked, you were sitting on the back porch and I asked you, I said, what time should we leave in the morning? And you're like, let's leave at 630. And my, so that was the stimulus. That's the stimulus, right? Something Is you happened. say, <laughs> we got to leave at 630 in the morning. So that caused a problem because I'm teaching a class at six from 5:30 to 6:30. So, you know, that's going to be the problem. Well, the belief that I had, the thoughts and the story that I told myself in that moment was this was your fault. Uh oh, I felt it. You kind of gave me that look, real. And I kind of, in fact, I said, "How did we miss that?" Meaning, how oh. did you fail to miss planning my day better? I have no idea. <laughs> I know I ain't got nothing to do with that. Don't want nothing so, to do with planning your days. So I, you know, the thoughts that I chose, the story that I told myself, what it, that it was your fault we hadn't planned that better. And the feelings, of course, now I'm mad at you. Because, all that happened instantly. It didn't yep, take about half a second doesn't take for all long. that to happen. So the choice is I go, I, you know, put my hands on my hips like I'm somebody special and say, well, how did we miss this? Right. So now I'm now I'm vocalizing the moment that I've blamed you. And the impact is you. I mean, you could have gotten frustrated right back at me and you know, blamed me for blaming you. So that, and you didn't, you had a very proactive response yourself, but, but if I had made a better choice in the moment of, of an emotional choice in saying, Oh, we've got a conflict on the schedule. And, and, you know, if I had chose a different thought pattern, a different story to tell myself, well, it's my schedule and I'm in control of it. Then I would have felt like oh, I'm responsible. I would have made a different choice with vocalizing um, how to resolve the conflict and I wouldn't have blamed you and you wouldn't have felt blamed. So that would have been an opportunity. I could have increased my influence instead of decreasing it as I'm sure I did. Now you were too kind to point that out. Um, but I share that example because it, it, it's easy to see the moment we start blaming other people instead of taking responsibility, 
yeah, it might feel good, but it doesn't help us move forward. I, I still had the conflict, right? I still had two places to be and only one of me. And, it, and we worked it out. At the end of the day, we just figured out you could meet me up there and that would save us 15 minutes and it was fine. So just an example of how blaming you, though, doesn't doesn't help me solve the problem. That's right. So for my listeners, my my, ra my Raven fans out there, they just need to know I still love you. It's going to be all right. <laughs> they also need to know how y'all like that, listeners. She was going to talk about me, but I used my influence and, and let her talk about her instead. How you like that, Rhea? <laughs> <laughs> since, since, since I couldn't get out of it and get you to stop, I just said, okay, let's talk about you instead of me. See how easy that is? It is easy. Influence. It is influence. Yep. <laughs> All right. So that was too good. Okay. So the first step at home, and you got the first step at home, the first step at work, and again, mastering the first step. That's the, you know, the three chapters we're still going to touch on right here. But there's chapters just like this for every one of the steps that, that you go through, just just helping the, the listeners understand that. So you, you, you got a quote at the top of uh, page 22. It says, self-control is one mark of a mature person. It applies to control of language, treatment of others, and the appetites of the body by Joseph B. Worthland, I think is how you say that. But you got a checklist, and I think you got a checklist in every one of these chapters mm -hmm. at, uh, for, for home and work. You got right. kind of a checklist. Uh, uh, so touch on some of those, any of them you want to, uh, some, of you, some of your bullet points at the end of this first step at home so the audience can understand kind of where you, where you wrap up the first step at home, what that means. Yeah. So there again, just a, some practical ways or, or some, some examples of what this would look like to apply this principle at home. Self so I mean, control of self, at control home. of self, right? So uh, being physically able to control our choices, our habits, our physical choices, having control of our emotions, so how do, what does that look like at home? So first and foremost, I think is always important, as I say, um, the first thing when, when I have control of self and I'm able to demonstrate that, what that looks like is I have a personal growth plan. I'm consistently developing myself on a regular basis. Now, whether that's reading a paragraph a day or a book a week or listening to a podcast uh, every day as you drive to work. Whatever, whatever it is, I have a plan and I'm consistently developing myself personally, you know, developing my mind, the way I think, developing and growing who I am as a person, raising my level of self-awareness. So that's the first thing. What that looks like to have control of self is I have a plan to help me grow. And then, um, you know, there, the next couple of steps talk about, well, am I consistent about applying what I'm learning? Um, am I working on resolving issues? Um, there's a couple down here that talk about I'm intentional with my physical health, eating, exercising. You know, yes, there can be indulgences in a bowl of ice cream sometimes, but keeping those indulgences to a moderate level, to a healthy level. So just a couple of examples of how that could work emotionally and physically. Did you say we were having ice cream after this? Nope. We've had our ice cream for the month already. <laughs> Y'all see how mean she is to me. <laughs> I made you a chocolate cake. Go have a slice of that. My goodness. We, I got to work on my influence real. <laughs> you do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You want to share another bullet or two? You got Let's see how many you got. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's nine bullets at the end of this chapter. You shared a couple. You want one more before we move to the first step uh, of work? You know, the last one I'm just going to touch on only because you mentioned it. Uh, I keep my commitments to my spouse, my children, and my family, right? Don't make promises I can't keep. If I say I will do something, I will do it. That's going to help me increase my influence at home. It matters. It matters everywhere. Commitments. We shouldn't make them and break commitments and we shouldn't make them lightly it's a big deal so the first step at work uh you, the, the opening quote for that chapter is uh i have learned that i really do have discipline self-control and patience but they were given to me as a seed and it's up to me to choose to develop them that's a pretty good quote you got to open up that chapter from joyce meyer and you you talk about control of self at work 
and you've got a, let's see, four, 13 bullet points at the end of this chapter. So mm -hmm. you want to hit on two or three of those before we talk about mastering the first step? Yeah. Um, so one of the things, you know, kind of some bullet points of what it looks like to have control itself of work. Um, I actively can control my emotions at work. So I think I pause, I reflect before speaking or acting in a meeting or with clients or with coworkers, right? That's control of self at work. Can I control myself when the customer or the client is blowing up and mad? And I can think of this in so many ways because we all have opportunities to get frustrated or mad when things go wrong, but it's hard, right? When someone, when a, a customer is blaming you for the situation and maybe it's not even your fault, but your ability to be proactive and control your emotions in that circumstance is going to allow you to increase your influence with your boss. So, but if you choose to be reactive and, you know, the client and customer gets mad at you and starts yelling at you and then you start yelling right back, that's going to decrease your influence with your boss at work, your leader. Um, I show up on time for work and meetings, right? We don't always think about that, but if I just have a track record of being right on the edge of a, a minute or so late for every meeting or, be, you know, right on the edge, I'm supposed to be there at eight o'clock and it's 8.01 sometimes when I actually get there, that's not instilling a lot of trust and confidence with our leader that they can depend on us, right? Because we're not demonstrating that it's important. We're saying, well, it's it's important that I get here, but I don't necessarily have to be prepared when I get here. Or I show up, but I'm not ready for the meeting. So that's a way we can increase our influence at work, being on time and being prepared. Good stuff. And I'll, I'll tell the audience, you know, these two chapters I talked about, you know, I, I got invited you to talk about some of the, the bullet points at the end of those chapters, but the chapter is not just a chapter full of bullet points. You've got some, you've got a couple of pages of content because again, these, this book's 30 chapters, three pages each. So each one of those chapters, you got about two pages of content or so, and, and then you got a, a bullet list at the end, just like a checklist for mm -hmm. people to reflect on and think about how they're doing. And one of them there at the end, I just got to, I just got to touch on it because it says, uh, I, I take initiative and give my best effort. That's one of the, the, the bullet points checklist. And then in parentheses that after that, you say, I realize if I can't be hundred percent committed to the team then I should find a different team. And that's, yes. it, it's so powerful because if you give if you really don't like the team you're on, you give an 80%, somebody else really likes the team they're on. They're giving a hundred percent. I promise you're going to get left behind by those people. Yeah, that's true. You're not going to have as much influence in that, in that respect. You're going to lose a lot. Yeah. You can't compete. Right. Because you ain't fully committed. So that's a good tip right there. Real. We can talk about that for a while, but we ain't going to dive into that one. So now let's go to the, the, the fifth and final chapter for that first step control of self. And I might have to get your permission later on after I get done doing my 30 part series on the blue collar leadership and teamwork. Maybe me and you or either me by myself could do a 30 part series on this book. Oh, my podcast. <laughs> was, was that asking for permission right there? <laughs> well, everybody's listening, Ria. They probably would like to hear me think, you know, teach on your book. I think that's that could be a possibility. Let's think about that. Okay, we'll have to talk about it over ice cream after a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So talk about mastering the step. And, and the uh, you just share that opening quote you got there on page 30. And, and then I'll... Uh, I just want to ask, yeah. talk to you about the middle of page 31. So Dan Butner says, the people you surround yourself with influence your behaviors. So choose friends who have healthy habits, right? Mm. And being proactive and having control of self is more than just ability to control emotions and thoughts and actions. It's about accepting responsibility for yourself. The choices that you've made in the past and reflecting on the choices you need to make right now to create the future that you want, right? If you want better health, you got to start making better health choices. If you want more money, you got to start making better choices relative to your career. Every choice that you've ever made has brought you to where you are today because we cannot control much of what happens in life. But in that moment of choice, every choice is either taking us forward and helping us move forward in life or it's not. And so we have to take ownership and say, you know what? I haven't always made the right choices, but 
my history is not my destiny. I can start making better choices today, so I'm in a better place tomorrow, next week, next year. So I want to move over and talk about, I want you to talk to this, uh, and you wrote about it here in the book, but it applies to a lot of people that are not necessarily in this situation, but in the middle of page 31, you've got in there that, uh, just to read it word for word, that paragraph says, someone recently called me for advice on how to handle a work situation with a coworker. Her coworker essentially sexually harassed, verbally sexually harassed her. And when she reported it to her supervisor in HR, it was brushed over and ignored by the leaders within the organization. And then in quotes you put in your book, you, that she, you know, basically you're telling her she has three options. Right. But this, I want you to talk about those three options, but, but also, you know, relative to her specifically, but it applies to a lot of other people in a lot of other situations. You basically, when things aren't going the way you want at work, you kind of got three options, right? No mm. matter what that is. Sure. Yeah. So the, the three options, number one, you can quit, right? It, it doesn't mean that the leadership is in the wrong. I mean, is in the right because culture is based on leadership and, you know, basically if the leadership is not supporting you and standing up for what's right, the first option is to quit. If you're like, you know what, I'm just not going to keep working here. I can't be committed to the team hundred percent because the leadership is not, you know, standing by what's right. But the culture isn't going to change until the leadership does. If the leadership's not going to change, then your first option is say, hey, you know, I'm going to find somewhere that that shares more of my values. And, so and again, for the audience, you you were you were giving this advice on the phone to someone you were mentoring, coaching yes. and mentoring. And yeah, yeah. but in the book, you, you write it out here. But but it applies to anybody for any reason if they don't like what's going on at work. Right. Sure. Yeah. OK, so you talked about one thing. You got two more to go. Quit was the first one. The second thing is you can keep working there and you can be miserable. You can blame the leaders because they won't address it or stop, right? And that's going to make you become angry. You're going to be angry every day when you go home for work. You're going to be bitter because it's tolerated. You're going to be frustrated because you're still working with this person. So if you if you choose to stay there and you choose to blame them, the leaders, because or the person who's doing it as well, it's going to, um, there again, the moment of choice is you're going to, start to feel angry you're going to start to feel bitter you're going to start to feel frustrated and the third choice is you can keep working there and you can control your emotions uh, again realizing that regardless of what that person says it doesn't mean it's right for them to say it but you have a choice to let you make make to let it make you upset and angry or not and it's not right that they say it but you don't have to choose to let it make you mad that's some that's some good advice you just gave and you know, as I'm listening to you and I'm looking at the words on the pages as you're talking about it, it's obvious which one of those is probably the easiest. The easiest to me would be for most people is number two, keep working there and be miserable. Yep. A lot of people, if you work somewhere, how many people that are you working with that are miserable? If, mm. if, if people are working in your organization, they're miserable. <laughs> they chose number two and yeah. number two is not a, not a good choice. And number one might not be a good choice either, but number three definitely is a good choice. Quit quitting could be a good choice if if you're prepared to quit and you have options and you just exercise in your options. But uh some people just get mad and quit, and then they and their family get in a in a in a mess. Mm. So a lot of people quit and quit quit but stay. That that's really what number two is. They quit but stay and, and they, they become miserable. Yeah. So yeah. I wanna we got a we got a few more minutes here. I want to just, we kind of covered the, touched on a little bit of the five chapters related to the first step, control of self, and just remind everybody there's four more steps with uh, 20 more chapters related to the steps. And the second step is character development. Third step is competency development. You do a really, really good job talking about competency development. That though, That's some good stuff. I really hope people will, will get this book and dive into it and go through it. And what you're teaching about character pretty much is the other four steps, but relative to competency development, that's pretty powerful. And then fourth step, commitment to developing others. Fifth step is contribution of service over time. And then at the end, you got two, two chapters, kind of closing chapters, or uh, it's what I kind of call it, the conclusion. Chapter 29 is mountain moments. Chapter 30 is keep climbing. 
So I want to go back to chapter 29 and, and just let you talk about mountain moments. Talk about whatever you want to talk about, mountain moments, and then we'll, we'll talk about the, the closing chapter. Keep climbing. Yeah, yeah, so when I, I love the term of mountain moments because I've heard you say before, if you're climbing a mountain, don't focus on the mountain. You focus on just the next step, right? The minute, the moment. The moment. Yeah. And if you conquer that moment, you can conquer the mountain if you conquer enough moments, but you got to keep climbing. And I, I use the analogy often, like when I'm running a marathon and I'm running 26 miles and you don't start off the race thinking, wow, I have 26 miles to go. You don't focus on all 26 miles. You just focus on this mile. Rhea, right? the, 26 miles is a long way to drive. I know it's an even longer way to run. Trust me. I understand that too. I run and get breakfast while you run a marathon. In case people were wondering what I do, you run a marathon and I, you run 26 miles and I run and get breakfast. <laughs> well, you know, we can come back to choices if we wanted to, to talk about that. Rhea, but let's talk it, about your book. Focus on your book. Every moment isn't always going to be a great moment, but every moment can be a defining moment because every moment there again is having the the possibility to take us closer to our goals or further away, right? The choices that we make are determining if that moment is great because the choice that we make is determining who we are becoming. Now, we don't have to get every choice right. Again, don't don't get overwhelmed with this. Just focus on getting this next choice right. And if you do that over and over again, life will take care of itself right? It's, it's just one of those things where you have to be intentional in the moment. Conquering the mountain isn't about the mountain. It's about the moments. Mm, that's good stuff. So the last and final chapter that we'll wrap up uh, today is your uh, chapter on uh, keep climbing. Mm -hmm. And so in, in there, you have a, a quote from Theodore Roosevelt. It's pretty popular. Some people might have heard it. Some people may not have heard it. Would you Would you actually read that? You have sure. your book available. You can read that. It's, it's the man in the arena, I think it's called. Just talk yep. about that and read that. It was part That's of so. a, a speech he delivered um, back in 1910. He says, it's not the critic who counts, nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, and who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. That's good stuff from uh, Theodore Roosevelt. So what, mm. you got anything right there you want to wrap up with after that? Yeah, just, you know, it, that quote is, it resonates because it reminds us that when we strive, we are going to fall short sometimes, right? We are going to both triumph and fail, but at least we've tried, right? Life is about living it. And we've got to strive to be the best person we're capable of becoming because if we're not, then life becomes empty and dull and meaningless. And when it's empty, we'll fill the void with empty things and wrong things, but they won't bring us lasting satisfaction. Living, living life isn't about having the most things. It's about stepping into your potential and, and living it um, in the way that, that you are created to be. That's pretty powerful. I'm going to read the very last paragraph out of your book, and we're going to close it up for today. And thank you very much for sharing your book, your knowledge, your life, and wisdom with us in the book, and also for coming and participating today. It, I, I had to drag her on the podcast, folks. She, she, I don't know what it is. <laughs> she's too busy. She actually, she's just busy. It's hard to get a hold of her, but I got her. I got her. And, and you make sure you, if you like her stuff, she's got a podcast and she's got great, great content. She's got a newsletter on LinkedIn and she, she's, she puts out a lot of great stuff and, uh, go check her out. But if you really liked hearing her and if you liked us kind of picking at each other and talking about that, Get get on our 
social media and let her know. Tell her, hey, Rhea, you need to be on the Blue Collar Leadership podcast a little more. Mac, it's hard for me to get her on here. Especially, you know, I, I want to get on here and just cut up and have some fun. I think y'all would like that. But she's she's so proper and everything. I, it you know, was I'm not hard to get Mac. me on here. You just had to sit down a minute. You're the one been gone all day. <laughs> all right. This last paragraph. You have anything else, Rhea? Because I'm going to read this paragraph and sign us off because it's just good for signing us off. Sounds great. Go for it. Okay. The greatest, this is Rhea's words, last paragraph in the final chapter 30, titled Keep Climbing, from the Ladder of Influence, Five Steps for Climbing to the Next Level and Beyond. Rhea says this, the greatest discovery you will ever make is realizing you hold the key to success in life. The most difficult challenge you will ever undertake is to lead and influence yourself in a way that allows you to realize it. Keep climbing, she says. That's it for today's episode. Next week, we'll be back into the 30-part series on blue-collar leadership, 30 traits of high-impact players. Hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Talk to you next time. Make it happen or someone else will. It might as well be you. Are you serious about taking your career and your life to the next level and beyond? Check out Max Story's Blue Collar Leadership Series books and others, now available on audio, along with paperback and ebooks at Amazon, iTunes, and Audible. Please visit bluecollarleadership.com to learn about Max books, programs, special offers, certifications, and more. Thank you for listening to the Blue Collar Leadership Podcast.